Hello everyone. It is time to have a live stream. Today we're going to talk <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about stray electricity in the aquarium, which is a very important topic and I wanted to make sure that I was going over that with you. Something's not right right here. Give me a second. Where is our conversation? Hmm. Let's try this. That's so weird. We're missing a overlay. There we go. All right. Now I got you guys on my screen. Today, uh, we are going to be talking about stray electricity and usually the way people discover it is they touch the water because there's a nick in their finger and they suddenly feel a little tiny jolt and you know, gets your attention really quickly. It's really important that you find what's causing that and resolve it. So today I've got some things next to me that I uh, believe will help you out and make your reef keeping experience a little safer. But I guess I should start off this thing with some kind of disclaimer, like I'm not an electrician, <laughs> uh, but I've survived aquariums for 20 years. So I'm going to basically give you some of the things that I do and some of the recommendations that I make are to help you obviously solve a problem, but at the same time we want to make sure that you uh, can live to tell the tale. So if you are super un... <clears throat> if you're fearful of electricity, if it just leaves you terrified, then you could get an electrician, but the problem is <sighs> electricians are used to dealing with electricity, they're not aquarium people, and we are people that have a box of water with at least 16 things plugged into it at any given time. And they may uh, not see it the way we see it. Or they might say, you can't do this, which is, um, I'm going to say I just disagree. Because obviously we can do it, we, we all do it. But there are situations where you want to limit your risk. For example, um, taking the aquarium out of the equation. The outlets that are near your kitchen sink or near your bathroom sink usually have a GFI button on them. And the GFI is designed that if for some reason something tried to electrocute you in the sink, that it would trip that plug immediately and save your life. That's the whole point. If you were to use GFI outlets near your aquarium only or exclusively, in theory, yes, that would stop all power. You know, a drop of water hits the outlet and boom, it trips that little switch and kills it. You don't want to deal with that because what will end up happening is you'll have a, a tank that dies because of a nuisance trip. So let me make sure my phone is on nice and silent here. Siri was getting involved. <laughs> Dwayne uh, just said he's playing with electricity today. So that was the last time you heard from Dwayne. <laughs> playing with electricity. And I've worked with electricity. I've run wires in the past and installed outlets and so forth. And I have articles about it that help you kind of visualize what you can and can't do and uh, what to avoid and, and what to be aware of. Now, I want to point out one thing here also. I'm basically dealing with electricity in the United States because that's the only electricity I've really dealt with. So I don't know that the advice I'm giving you today will help you with European power supply, for example, which is just wired differently. So you have to do some homework in that regard and feel free to let me know what you've learned. But... The bottom line is, if you're getting zapped by your tank, we want to fix that. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to put on some rubber-soled shoes so you're not standing barefoot on the floor, preferably not standing in a puddle working on measuring electricity in your tank. Now, this right here is a very cheap voltage meter that I got at Harbor Freight. I think I paid $7 for it with a coupon. <laughs> and it just has a simple on-off switch and the uh, display is, uh, oh, look at that, it's working decently now. Before when I was messing with it, it was, some of the numbers were messed up. So, yeah, there's the mess up number I was expecting. See now, you can see there's a little L LCD uh, filament. I don't know what you call those, one little bar is gone. Super old. Then, I bought myself a nice fancy one that I don't know how to use. <laughs> I really don't. I have to call Bobby, my friend, and say, okay, what do I set it to now? And then what do I do? And he tells me. So owning some kind of a voltage meter that you can read is important. And analog works. Analog means there's a needle that bounces back and forth. 
and then digital of course would be numbers on the screen which is preferable and you know for less than 10 bucks you can get one why not just go digital if you're being zapped by your aquarium like I said it's usually because you tore your fingernail off a little bit so you expose some of that uh, nail bed or you've nicked your skin and so when you're reaching in to feed the tank or something you feel the jolt through that little slice obviously I don't want you to keep putting your finger in the water over and over and over to get jolted that's dumb but if you felt it once, then you need to investigate, and owning a meter like this would be key. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about plugs. So here is a common American plug. Two-prong, not grounded, and uh, this is actually kind of a goofy cord I got for trade shows, because that's the only time I need this type of plug. And it actually has two extension cords that, again, are not grounded whatsoever. They are just two-prong holes. So that would not benefit us on our aquarium, with some of the gear we use. Here's an example of a different extension cord that uses three prongs. The ground is the bottom, you've got your common, and you've got your, your uh, hot. The hot is always smaller, the common is the larger one. That's why a lot of times when you try and plug something and you have to turn it right side up, because it's always the other direction of what you think. It's almost as bad as USB, right? <laughs> so you're trying to plug in um, a hair dryer, a vacuum cleaner, a toaster oven, you know, those things, they have to fit in a certain direction. And so you want to make sure that you are not trying to force in something that doesn't fit properly, number one. And you also do not want to be one of those people that says, well, I don't have room for this part, so I'm just going to break this off. This is a very important part of your plug. It is the grounding prong that goes to the ground of your home or your apartment. And you want to make sure that your stuff is grounded if it's designed that way. So can you get by without a ground? Yes. Are you safer? No. You want to be safe. So... In the case of, a, of measuring with a meter, I'm going to ask you to uh, imagine, if you will, that I'm not holding a plug, but that I'm holding you know, this is a wall outlet with a three prong hole in the cover plate. And what we're going to do is we're going to be focusing on the bottom hole, the round hole. That is going to be what we're testing. And all you're going to do, this, I need three hands. I can't do this with just two but we're gonna do our best. You are going to want to put your black wire from your meter inside the round hole. And you're gonna to have to kind of tilt it slightly. You might have to, you know, kind of, because obviously much smaller than the opening itself, so we wanna make sure that it's making contact with the metal inside. That is your ground wire to the house. Then the other part of the meter is going to touch the water in your sump or your display tank. That's all you got to do. And we're trying to see if any numbers appear on the screen. So you'd want to set your meter to AC power, not DC, AC. And we want to see if this number changes from zero to anything higher. And if you were to measure and you saw one or two, you know, I'm saying one, like 1 1.15 or some super low number, that's not a lot of power. There's some power in the water, and it could even be conductive. Uh, in other words, the magnets spinning inside your pumps are creating a little bit of electrical current inside the water itself. A little tiny reading is okay, but if you're measuring 15, 24, 38, 50, 100 volts, that is going to be a problem. And if I say anything wrong in this live stream, I apologize, but I am trying to get the idea across to you I'm not the educator in um, all things electricity. But we want to make sure that we have as low a number as possible inside your, uh, your water. And so how do we solve that? Let's say you've measured and you have this high crazy number. And, you know, let's say it's 50. Well, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to unplug every single thing from your tank. All 16 items, right? Pull out every single plug. And then you're going to put the grounding probe into the... Uh, wall outlet and you're going to put the red wire inside the water and you're measuring it should show zero because it's just a body of water not connected to any kind of electricity whatsoever and it should read zero if it does then we proceed and we plug in the first item and we do another test and we see it still says zero we unplug that item we plug in the next one and you work your way systematically through all 16 plugs until you have determined what item or items is causing this now it could be a heater that is leaking electricity, it could be a power head. I had a Penguin power head pump, super old, ancient pump, still ran, and I threw it in my refugium many years ago to create some flow in there so that the plants weren't so stagnant. And 
you know, who knew that thing was leaking power into my water? Just an old power head. And it, like I said, it was working. It didn't smell funny, didn't look funny. Nothing would give you an indication that there was a problem, but I was getting zapped when I'd reach into the sump. And so I determined that that power head had to go. And then you plug in the next item and the next. Another thing that's happened in the past for some people is that their T5 lighting inside their aluminum reflectors, hanging above the tank but not touching the tank, was actually giving off a little bit of power to the, to the system, to the ecosystem. And they actually had to ground the reflector, run a wire from the reflector to a grounding screw on like a ballast or straight to the, uh, the screw in the center of a, a wall outlet. That's another way to ground something. So that was their workaround to remove any kind of stray electricity from hitting the water. I also want to talk to you about some of these products that I use for when our plugs start to discolor or even turn white and they get kind of hideous. This is one that I've had for about 10 years. One can has lasted forever. And all you would do is just spray it on there and it oils this up and then you, you blot it dry and then you can plug it in and out of the outlet a few times and it actually lubricates the plug and lubricates the tines and it becomes easier to plug in and out, which is super great with like pumps you use occasionally. For example, if you're doing a water change and you had a, a mag pump and you use it once a month and you, every time you're trying to plug it in, it's always like such a battle to get it into the wall. And then when you're pulling, you feel like you're gonna pull the outlet right out of the wall. Just spray that stuff on there. So this right here is called 226. I'm sure I got this at Home Depot. I checked my shelves, I found more stuff. Here's another one I found. This one's, you know, everything's dirty and disgusting for my workshop. But anyway, you can see it deoxidizing. And you can use this to clean your electrical contacts. And I even found this giant can of one too that I believe I used last year. And you can use it to spray down things, get them clean, um, and basically make your plugs nice and safe to use again. So that is exactly how you eliminate or how you track down what is causing the problem and then solving it. So let's uh, talk about grounding probes as well because that is going to be the most highly debated thing on this video, I'm sure, because people have very strong opinions about this. When it comes to a grounding probe, what we're talking about is a wire or a prong that goes to that hole in the bottom of your outlet, this one down here, and the other end is gonna go right into the sump. And the reason for the grounding probe is to send the power that's in the system straight to the ground, which is the ground wire of your home. So your whole house has electrical outlets everywhere. And all of those outlets have a ground wire on them. And they all lead to a copper wire that is usually sunken into the earth, I don't know, six, 10 feet deep, something like that. Maybe, maybe it's only two feet, I don't know, I'm an electrician. But the grounding probe is to keep you alive. That's the whole point for it. And if we were to run a grounding probe from our aquarium to the ground in the outlet, which goes to the ground, you know, copper, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say, rod that's jammed into the ground, that is going to be a way to move the electricity away from you and to ground as quickly as possible. Now, there are people out there, and I'm, I'm not even playing devil's advocate. I'm just telling you they're going to say, don't do that. That's absolutely crazy. It's super dangerous. You should never do that. I completely disagree with that. I believe that I'd much rather, if I am working over my tank and I'm adjusting the lighting and somehow the entire light rack comes crashing down into the water with all the lights on, I want all the power to go away from me as fast as possible. I want breakers to trip. I want the, the ground to absorb all the power, and I want to live. That is the reason for a ground probe inside my aquarium. And if you don't have one, then you're relying on the circuit breaker to trip or the GFI button to pop, which they both can and hopefully will do. But a ground probe in the water keeps me safe. And like I said, redirects power. That doesn't mean I want to leave the power in the water forever. Obviously I do not. I want to solve that problem and remove it. <clears throat> and then this is like my, my safety, my, my backup, my my net under the tightrope to keep me from getting hurt. Some people <clears throat> walk around their tank all day long with bare feet, and I mentioned this earlier in the stream, and they step on a wet spot or they are reaching their tank and they're feeding their tank. And that's when they find this stray electricity. 
Will the ground probe prevent you from feeling that electricity? Yes, because it's redirecting it away. Does that mean your fish are swimming through electricity? Yeah, some of that power is actually, they're swimming through it. But the fish are swimming through water. <clears throat> it's not like they're just touching a fin to power power and getting zapped. <laughs> and uh, I, I guess I can only compare that slightly, it's a terrible analogy, to how birds can stand on one wire, but they don't touch both wires on the power lines. And so that way they don't turn into, you know, roasted chicken. They, they uh, can land on it, stand on it, preen and then fly away and they live to, to see another day. With our aquariums, if we have electricity in the water, some of your fish can display uh, signs of disease. Um, head and lateral dis uh, line disease is one HLLE. And that one is one that usually is prevalent or prevalent on tangs and you would see their spine more than you should. Uh, you could even see the scales flaking off and uh, they can get basically like a hole in their face, a hole in the head. So we wanna look for stray electricity to remove it. And so you would have to remove your grounding probe from the aquarium before you do all the tests I described. And then once you're done and you've eliminated anything and you're sure that you're power free, then you can put your ground probe in there to keep yourself safe again. If you wanted to uh, verify that your tank does not have any stray electricity in it two times a year, that would be super wise. And it's, it's always good to double check your equipment and make sure everything's functioning properly, make sure everything's clean, make sure the salt creep has been uh, uh, cleaned away or wiped away so that there's no chance of salt mixing with electricity, mixing with water, which leads to fires. And we don't want to have any fires in our homes. We don't want to have any of our livestock perish. We care very much about our aquariums and we want to eliminate these problems. So I'm hoping that this topic today that we went into briefly will kind of give you some insight on how to check for electricity in your tank. Now, I'd like to answer some of your questions <clears throat> and see if I can not miss people this time. I actually asked my uh, moderators if they could drop questions in here. Ian asks, is it possible for stray electricity to harm your corals in any way? <clears throat> <sighs> you know, I've never, specifically heard of corals suffering from it, but I did notice that, you know, I mean, like I said before, fish are affected by it. And <clears throat> there was a, a study done a while back. <clears throat> Sorry, something in my throat. <clears throat> uh, there was a thing done a while back where they put like rebar frames in the ocean and they trickled in a very low amount of electricity and planted corals all over the rebar and the corals grew a little quicker. So to say the electricity is detrimental to corals would just, I guess you would have to base it on how much electricity is being added. If it's just a small amount, it's not a factor. If it's you know a significant amount, yes, you could see real issues in your tank. Uh, Virginia asks, what about power strips with a surge protection? Yeah, those are good and they, the, the power strip that has a surge protection built in should capture weird things like lightning strikes near your home. But <laughs> the lightning traveled, I don't know how far, let's just say it traveled a half a mile, a quarter of a mile, some big, huge amount. And your power strip has a little spot this wide that the electricity has to just scooch, scooch across to get through the power bar. If the power or the lightning hits your home uh, directly, it's going to fry things left and right, including your aquarium and, and your television and your internet and you know, everything. I mean, you're just going to, it's going to be a big giant disaster on your hands. But having a surge protector can protect you from brownouts and from spikes in electricity. But the surge protector may not trip if it's like a slow trickle. So that's not a guaranteed solution. Uh... Mateus asked if I'll be coming to Reef Currents in Houston. I believe I will be. I'm not 100% positive, but I'd like to. I enjoy that show. Brian asked if I've ever considered doing Google Hangouts. I have not. Um, but who knows? It could happen. Um, Tyler asks, if I've never seen any scolemia in your tank. Do you have any? No, actually, I don't have any scolies. I... Uh, I like them. I just haven't purchased one. They're usually rather expensive, and 
they just haven't. Actually, what I'm really leaning toward getting these days are A cans. I'm I'm kind of in the mood to start acquiring A cans. I don't know. I've seen, I've seen a few pictures of people's tanks just loaded up with a huge group of them. They're gorgeous and in so many colors, and they they get along so well as a group. And I kind of want to do that. So maybe this year I'll start gathering up or collecting A can frags and turn them into A can colonies. That would make me really happy. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, so I hope that uh, electricity conversation wasn't too short for you. <laughs> short. But it's really not a dangerous thing to check for stray electricity. You're not going to get electrocuted testing for stray electricity, so you shouldn't fear that. But if you have someone that is willing to do it with you, that would be nice. You know, you could have a secondary person that can make sure that the ground probe is actually staying in the ground of the wall. Uh, while you're focused on touching water. I, I, I know that could be nerve-wracking. You're like, well, there's a wire going to the wall, and I'm putting a wire into the water with my hands. You could wear rubber gloves. You could wear the rubber shoes, you know, the uh, rubber-soled shoes. I mean, yes, but you should not be submerging your hand in the water, and you're not putting the prong into the hot outlet of the outlet. You're putting it into the ground hole. Ground, ground, ground. Think ground. Ground is all we're talking about. Now, I do want to mention this, and this is one of the reasons this live stream happened. A guy in Club Milo's Reef recently posted that he was getting shocked by his tank and all he had added was the ground probe from the ground outlet to the water and he's getting shocked. And when he removed it, he was not. Which told us that there was something wrong with the electrical of his home. And that's a big deal. That is way beyond aquarium problems. That's a home problem because that means some of the power from the common or from the hot, actually the hot, is hitting the ground and powering the ground line throughout the house. So at least through one circuit, if not more. So it'd be very important to have an electrician correct that one. You don't have to correct that one yourself. They have a device that's relatively small, um, about the size of a, like the charger we use in our car to charge your cell phones, you know, you put in the cigarette lighter. And that's got like three little lights on the front. You know, typically you want it to be green, green, red something along those lines, and they sell them for about 10 bucks at Home Depot. And you can just go into every outlet in your house and plug it in the wall and plug in the wall and plug in the wall and make sure that the lights are lit up correctly. And if, they're, if there's a... Uh, I'm trying to say the right terminology. Cross... <laughs> My brain is saying pollinization. That's wrong. Uh, cross polarization. I don't know. They're... If the wires are crossed inside the wall, like someone put one outlet together wrong, where they, when you have an outlet in the wall, there's gonna be screws on both sides, and it will always say white on the side that's supposed to be white wires, and then black will be the opposite side. And if someone crosses the white and the black, then it can create this weird uh, electrical issue where you have things that still turn on and still run, but you're feeding power into the ground line, which is going straight to ground which you don't want to do because that's uh, a risk to you and your home. So we want to make sure we solve that problem. All right. Uh, diesel? I think it's diesel. He asked about the dimensions of my tank. I actually replied to that person <clears throat> on, my, uh, on my YouTube channel. And I gave him a link to all the pictures of the tank before it was even filled with water. It's 84 inches long, it's 36 inches wide, it's 30 inches tall. It's got one inch of uh, double euro bracing on the top to keep it together. Uh, I believe the bottom is one inch glass. All the walls are three quarter inch glass. There is a piece of black acrylic at the far end. So you don't see the overflow box. You don't see all that plumbing, which I really like. And the uh, tank is right at 400 gallons. Uh, Shane asked me, any update on the product to use to clean your, your Live Rock? Uh, the Live Rock Enhanced product, I used it three or four times in my frag system, and magically it has almost completely eliminated all the cyanobacteria in that tank. <laughs> the rock itself didn't really look dirty, um, but I went through the tank a couple days ago because I had some empty snail shells I wanted to get off the substrate, and I was able to pull algae off there as well. And uh, it just pulled right off nice and, I mean, not completely, but most of it just came off without too much trouble. And I went ahead and, uh, like I said, I've used it several times just to see what it would do to cyano. I was curious because that tank had some cyano and I had to deal with it anyway. Uh, 
So I haven't used it in my reef a second time. I've been dosing other stuff and I hate to put multiple things in my tank. I've got a video that's coming out later today on YouTube that's gonna be about dosing lanthanum chloride. I already have a video about phosphate RX. This time I'm gonna talk about lanthanum chloride directly. And that video will be about, I don't know, maybe less than 10 minutes for once. <laughs> and that one, I'm going to actually show you what my tank looks like when it's being dosed and uh, go into my thoughts. And one of the things that I'm going to emphasize in that video, and I'm just telling you now, is you know, like a, a teaser, is anything you want to use in your tank, anything brand new that you're interested in, you don't have to use it at full strength. You can use it at half the strength and see what happens and observe your livestock and observe your equipment to make sure everything makes sense. And if it does, then you could dose later a larger amount to get the goal you're reaching for. So that video is about to come. I've already got it sitting inside uh, Final Cut Pro and I've got to do all the narration stuff next and uh, maybe add a little bit more footage of the aquarium. Uh, someone gave me a super chat. Mega Birdman, thank you very much. That was super nice of you, and I really appreciate that. Uh, Tyler asked the question, do tank dimensions help you figure out the amount of water the tank holds? Yes and no. Um, math helps you determine how much water the aquarium holds. The tank dimensions are more like a basic number. Like, for example, if you go to Home Depot and you buy a 2x4, it is not 2 inches by 4 inches at all. And ironically, the only thing that's actually the right length is the length. It'll be 8 feet or it'll be 92 and 5 eighths. Because 92 and 5 eighths plus a 2 by 4 at the top and bottom gives you an 8 foot wall for sheetrock to be adhered to. But um, getting off of lumber and back onto aquariums, when you buy a 180 gallon aquarium, they are measuring the outside of the trim, which is a 6 foot by 2 foot. I'm, did I say 180? Yeah, 6 by 2 by 2. That's 180 gallons. But internally, it doesn't hold 180 gallons. So using math, you can measure the inside of the aquarium using a tape measure and get the length, which may be 71 inches long. It could even be a little bit less. And then internally, it may only be 23 inches wide. And then your height is not from the bottom of the trim to the top of the trim, but it's going to be from the inside glass to wherever the water stops because you're not going to fill it to the brim and you may discover you only have 160 gallons of water in that aquarium. So using math, we would figure that out. And it's going to be, the formula is length times width times height in inches divided by 231. And uh, I did a, a live stream about this topic about a month ago, so you can go watch that. Because in there I also, for fun, looked up how they do it with metric numbers. And uh, it was a very simple solution. But now I'm not positive because I've slept since then. But it was something, again, it was length times width times height, but I think it was all done in millimeters, and then that told you how many liters you had. So, uh, Glenn asks, is there any news with Apex bringing out anything new this year? Uh, the big news is Trident, and uh, Trident is the new device that will measure alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium. And it is coming to market very, very soon because everything I'm seeing looks great. Number one, I've noticed that uh, Neptune Systems isn't talking about anything else. They are literally staying on topic. And all the people that have gotten a unit already have been sharing their experiences so far in the Neptune support group on Facebook. And it's been lots of positivity. Not a lot of negative stuff. I, mean, I haven't seen anything negative, really. So it really comes down to owning a 2016... Apex, or, and I think I'm I think I'm right about this, being able to buy just the brain, and then buying the Trident, which will then uh, be able to measure all three of these parameters. The tests take roughly about 25 minutes to perform. Uh, it does the test a couple of times a day. Uh, actually, mathematically, it's four times for alkalinity, twice for calcium, twice for magnesium. And all the data is stored in the in Apex Fusion to where you can just review it on a graph and you can actually watch your alkalinity for the day. That's pretty amazing. <clears throat> now, let me pull away from that topic for a second and talk about my tank, because, you know, I watch my reef very closely every single day. I try to test my water every week. I always encourage you guys on Water Test Saturday, test your water, and then sometimes I don't even follow through on it. It makes me really mad and annoyed with myself that I'm telling you one thing, and then I'm not... Uh, I gotta do it, too. And I have the test kit sitting right there on the counter in front of me, 
and then do I take the time to actually do all my tests? And sometimes it just gets away from me. So I did all my testing this week, and my alkalinity had dropped quite a bit on the reef. It was down to 6.5, so I buffered it back up, and I refilled my calcium reactor with more media, and uh, now it's back at like 8.5. So all is well again. But if I had had the Trident, it would have told me immediately that I could have just seen the, the graph. Because when something's brand new, you check it all the time. But then you can set up notifications inside Apex Fusion to tell you when parameters get out of whack so that you can investigate. So we definitely want to do that. All right. Um, and other things from them, I don't know. I really don't. Uh, Nanofish asks, are wood stands as sturdy as, uh, as they should be? And I'm going to say that a lot of times when we build a stand out of wood, we make it way, way, way too strong. We build it big enough to put a car on top of. And I guess I need to have you guys wait. Someone's ringing my doorbell. Be right back. <laughs> um, all right. So talking about wooden stands versus steel stands, uh, think of also how they're being built out of wood because some people build them out of two by fours and two by sixes and four by four posts and treated lumber, which by the way, I want to mention, we should never use treated lumber for our aquarium stands. And I know you would think, well, that's crazy. Treated lumber lasts 40 years. I want something that's going to last forever. Well, number one, you're not going to have your tank for 40 years. Uh, there's, it's not going to last 40 years, even if you did everything right. So what we're thinking about instead is something that will be strong and sturdy and not collapse. But treated lumber, as it dries out, it twists and it cracks. And so it's not good for an aquarium stand because you might make a perfectly square stand and then six weeks from now, it's all tweaked and leaning. And that would be a detrimental situation to your aquarium. So using white pine is usually sufficient. Uh, I chose with my aquarium to use a steel stand because I wanted something forever and I didn't want to think about it ever again. And I was deciding that I would trust welds over nails and screws. But my last aquarium was made on a two by six frame and it was super sturdy and I would get up on top of it all the time and work in the tank. And when it was time to tear it out, it was so hard to rip out. <laughs> it was very well built. Now, there are stands on the market that are just made out of three quarter inch plywood. And the plywood is just basically all stapled together with some glue. And that actually can work as well because of the way the plywood is designed. The problems we run into with wooden stands is if they didn't use plywood and they use something like MDF, which is a medium density fiberboard. And it basically it is dust or, you know, uh, wood filler that's been glued together to create this sheet. And when it gets wet, it swells and it gets weak. And we're around aquariums, you know, with water spilling and, and leaking and dripping and just ruins the MDF. <clears throat> so we would prefer to have real plywood because plywood can get wet and the water can run down it and drain through it and it can dry out and it might become a little more brittle but it, it retains its shape pretty well and it's more reliable. And then also plywood, <clears throat> the end of it, you know, is very sturdy. Now, if you take a sheet and lay it flat and press down, yeah, you can bend a sheet of plywood, you know, with your weight, but we're standing it on edge and we're putting the aquarium on top of the edge and the edge is very, very strong. The shear factor is excellent. So that's why when they build a new home and they have all those two by four standing everywhere, the first thing they do is they put on two sheets of plywood on the corner so that way the building will stay sturdy and won't start racking. They prevent it from racking by shooting on the plywood. So plywood's excellent and it can be a very sturdy stand. There are stands out there that could make you nervous. All right. Uh, the blue tang is not gone. It is still swimming around in the anemone cube. And uh, she was briefly in the video I put on Instagram uh, yesterday when I showed the snail wearing two anemones and an extra snail on its body. Craziness and uh, Dory was swimming around in there. Caesar asks, oh, wait, Chuck, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, Caesar asks, how do I get rid of bryopsis? Uh, 
The one product that everyone likes is fluconazole, and there is a product on the market called Reef Flux. Uh, there's also, um, I think Blue Life came out with something new called Flux RX, maybe? And that one surprised me. I didn't even know it existed, and I sell Blue Life. And so I, uh, it's a product you can put in your aquarium, you turn off your skimmer, and over a period of about three weeks, the, the algae will just die off. The funny thing is about uh, fluconazole products that are sold in the aquarium trade is everything you read says, here's what to use, but it doesn't mention anything about killing algae. And I think someone's trying to stay out of, uh, out of trouble with the law. <laughs> so I thought it was weird, really weird because it's like, well, everyone knows that's to get rid of bryopsis. Why aren't they just saying that? But they've re they don't include that in any of the descriptions on any of the websites I checked. I thought that was interesting. <clears throat> oh, the plushy blue ting. This one right here. Yep, he's still floating around. He's never too far away. And by the way, someone asked me where I got that one, and it took me a while to remember, and I finally figured it out. I did not buy it. I won it in our uh, club's... Uh, it was the Winter Social, and we do a white elephant exchange. And the white elephant game is so fun, and we do it every year. And uh, I was... I think I was one of the last people to pull a present out so no one could steal it from me. It was great. So I ended up winning that. And I loved it. It was perfect for me. And it was great to have in the background in some of my videos. Uh, John asks the question, what is the average lifespan of an aquarium? There's this weird saying that goes around in the industry that things only last about five years. And there's going to be stories where it goes much longer and there's going to be some that fail much sooner. But that, that weird number has stuck. I'm not saying it's fact, but to plan on an aquarium lasting you five years would be great. Uh, to hope it'll last 10 years would be uh, the way I would look at it. You know, I, I'd like to think of things lasting 10 years, but nothing is forever. And just because you spend a lot of money doesn't mean that you're going to be guaranteed you know, success. Uh, you know, that sometimes tanks just let go, and that's the end of it. My uh, brand new custom-made aquarium that I that you guys see on this channel, when it was built the first time, after 13 months, it sprung a leak, and they had to rebuild it. So um, I'm in this tank now. I've been in it for over five years. Uh, we're coming up on five and a half, and I am hoping for 10, <laughs> because that would be great. That would that was kind of my uh, my my goal in the first place was like a 10-year tank. Okay, Larry asks about using, he has, he's got Aptasia everywhere, he's using Aptasia X to remove it, and they come back even more. So this is something I've probably mentioned before in the past because it caught my eye. In America, when we see a problem, we want to throw something at the problem, and then we just expect it to magically be taken care of. And in Europe, I talked to some hobbyists over there, and when they have a problem, they deal with the problem every single day until it's gone, so it never comes back. And I thought that's an interesting uh, attitude, because I don't think we do that over here in the U.S. as much. I, I think that we could learn from the European hobbyists in that regard. If you have Aptasia in your tank, let's say you have 100 Aptasia, okay? Let's just use a round number. And let's say you put Aptasia X on 10 of them today, and then... A couple days later, you do another 10, and a couple days later, you do another 20, let's say. You know, I'm, bottom line is, don't do all 100 on the first day, because all that chemical in your tank at once can affect your livestock. It's just too much of the stuff in the water can create some toxicity issues, and we want to avoid that. So try to tackle it in sections, like a quarter of the tank or a third of the tank. Depends on how big your tank is. Or if you can, remove the item from your tank, deal with cleaning it or applying paste or whatever you're going to do to kill stuff, and then you'll rinse it and put it back in the tank when you're done, maybe. But then after you've done it, don't just assume you've taken care of it. I did a video um, six months ago showing me how I killed or scraped off Mahanos off my live rock in the frag system. And I scraped off hundreds of them. And I got them all the way down to maybe four. And right now that tank probably has about eight. And if I were to go in there and get rid of those eight, the problem would be completely solved forever. But because I have not done that yet, 8 is going to become 10 or 12, and then it's going to become 20, and it's going to become out of hand. So I've got to deal with it. And I'm very aware of them, and I actually pulled out a couple of uh, 
Aptasia that were easy to grab recently, but I've got some Mahanos I need to hunt down and get rid of. But Aptasia X is not growing more Aptasia. I promise you that. And I like to find the critter, stop all the flow in the tank, and then apply that stuff on there like frosting on a cupcake. I want to completely cover it, and then after a total of 15 minutes has elapsed, I turn the flow back on. And then whatever, you know, survives, you know, get them again in the near future. Don't, don't uh, just expect it to work a one-time deal, because it won't. Uh, Michaelito, Michaelito asks, what are the benefits of a mature tank? Well, it's so much easier to maintain versus a, a young, immature tank because stability seems to have been established. Whether you as the hobbyist becomes more mature with the tank, you know, your husbandry has become better, or it's just not going through all these weird cycles that newer tanks go through. They go through an algae bloom, and then you solve that one, and another one comes, and then you, a third algae wave comes, and then finally you start getting the color of the rock you wanted, and then you got some plague you're dealing with. <laughs> and there's just this weird topsy-turny situation, plus even dosing your tank to maintain your, your good water quality can be tricky. And if you can learn your tank and become connected with your tank, the tank and you gain maturity together. You, you learn its nuances and you can catch things early on before they become problematic and become expensive to fix. Tyler asks, would you get a bigger tank in the future? <sighs> no, but I think what I would like to do is put a tank on the floor. And I just think it would be really cool to have a tank that's maybe four feet tall that sits right on the floor, and then you could have the sump behind it. It doesn't have to be under it. And that way you can still have your filtration and, all, and you can reach everything. But I feel like that way you can look down from above and really appreciate the reef all the time. And then when you're sitting down, it's at that viewpoint where you can just kind of look right at it. And when you're looking at a tank that's down on the floor like I'm describing, your eye line will actually go downhill slightly to see the tops of the corals that are growing so beautifully. Because when you stand in front of an aquarium that's down low, you have to bend down to look. And when you are standing in front of an aquarium that's the right height, you're seeing the side of the coral. And when you get above the tank, look down, you're like, oh my God, it's so gorgeous. I mean, it's beautiful. And so I really love the idea of a tank right on the floor that stands tall enough that I can appreciate it. I could have my grandson go up to it and put his hands all over the glass and look at the fishies. That'd be fine. But then if I have to reach in the tank, I can reach in very easily. And I don't know. I, I'm not sure how to like deal with the top part other than have really pretty fixtures, uh, you know, things that are modern, sexy looking, that would just look really nice and appealing. And then I would definitely have some kind of a system where I could elevate those out of my way to work in the tank and have the light above me. And I think that would be great. Uh, obviously, you have to also consider what might spill into the tank, what could fall into the tank. You know, how do you protect against that? But that's just semantics. That's just figuring out and being logistically uh, wise. Uh, Dustin asks, uh, I have sponge growing within my zoanthids. Will it overtake them? Actually, yes, that can happen. It is possible for sponge to grow between them and do nothing, or it can grow really large. Sponge is something you can peel out. You can use dental tools and scrape it out. You can use toothpicks or a, a, a shish kebab skewer and scrape it out. You can get uh, go to the store and buy a really soft toothbrush and brush those polyps very gently in between to clean that out. And take a power head and blow in between all those. Uh, speaking of cleaning rock work, the Nero 5 pump that I'm using my frag system is got a huge long cord on it, and it is a great way to clean your live rock once a week. You know, it's holding to the glass with a magnet. You can just pull it off, and you can just point it at all your rock work and just blow off all the corals and all the rock and get all the detritus loose and kicked up. So that way that stuff can flow down the drain and be captured either in a filter sock or uh, a clear or clarity fleece roller, or your protein skimmer can pull it out or you can vacuum the detritus out of your sump later. But that's a super handy one. When you're done, just put the power head back on the magnet. Super nice. I used to use something like one of these extension cords plugged into a maxi jet, and I would take a maxi jet and blow everything off. But that Nero 5 moves a lot of water, and it's the size of a, you know, it fits your palm beautifully like a puck, and you can just kind of blow everything off real quick and dirty and, and make the tank clean. <laughs> Uh, what is the best way to get rid of pulsing zinnia? 
I cut it out and it keeps growing back. Well, um, pulsing zinnia is beautiful when it's controlled and when you have too much of it, it definitely is gonna be a problem. It always grows toward the light. So typically it's gonna be near the top of your tank. It's gonna be going up the walls of your tank, up the back of your tank. Uh, it always wants to grow upward. You should be able to peel off some. Um, and I would remove what you can remove and try to isolate it into an island if you can, you know, some kind of a pretty spot. But yeah, it can become problematic, but it's really pretty. It's, and it's a great way of knowing how your tank is doing by just glancing at it. If they're not pulsing, some of your water parameters are off. It could be salinity. It's more than likely alkalinity problems. It's not gonna stop pulsing because magnesium's low. <laughs> but it's a great visual indicator just glancing at your tank as you're walking by. Hey, I need to check the water. Something's not right because the zinnia is not pulsing. So that's kind of a cool one to have. Gavin asked, do you still have the laser for Aptasia? I do, and I haven't used it in a while. I, uh, I always think, oh yeah, I should get the laser out and do it, and I just don't. I, uh, I just kind of like ignore the situation, and then I just deal with it while my hands are wet and I'm working in the tank. But uh, if I were to keep the batteries charged up, ready to go, I'd probably grab a laser in a heartbeat and just zap what I can. And it's just one of those things that's sort of like, it's a fun thing, it's not a regular tool for me, and I don't keep it ready. In comparison, I keep my phone always charged and I keep the battery always charged for my camera. But the laser is always like an afterthought. I was like, oh yeah, let me go charge that. And I have to go wait for the battery to be ready, or batteries in that case, and then work your way through the tank hitting a few things. So there's times where I've, I've said, okay, I'm going to do it tomorrow, and I prepared, and there's times where I'm like, oh, I wish I'd gotten ready, but it's too late now, and I'm not going to do it. Could the sump be on top, Tyler asks. Yes, you could have a sump above your tank. It's a little more tricky because, uh, you know, all the equipment that sits in the sump is going to be even higher up, so it's harder to reach and work on. You've also got the water draining down from the sump into the display that could include air bubbles, which is what happens when you have a sump under the tank. The water drains down and it's air and bubbles that goes into your sump. So you'd almost have to drain from your above the tank sump into something like a filter sock or a bubble chamber so that way you just have nice clean water. But uh, not too many people are putting sumps above their, their tank. Now, if you were talking about my dream tank of sitting on the floor, if the tank is four feet tall, and I have an external overflow box that's only about six or eight inches tall, I literally have enough room for water to go into the overflow box and then drain into a sump behind the tank. And if I lived uh, in a different part of the United States, I'd have a basement, I can just put the sump down in the basement and I could have my tank right on the floor, which would be awesome. But I would need to have a very strong floor to hold that much weight. Uh, I'd have to reinforce the floor significantly to make sure it could handle, you know, let's say another 400 gallon aquarium or maybe even more because it would be a foot taller than what I have now. Well, maybe 18 inches taller than I have now. Yeah, that's right. All right. Uh, Dustin says, wouldn't your tank be like, more like a stable tank if you started with a live rock and got water from an established tank? Uh, okay, so let's just do a real life comparison. You set up a brand new aquarium and you put in sand and you put in dry rock, you know it's immature. Let's say you start up a brand new tank and you use all live sand and you use live rock. Still a brand new tank. Let's say your tank leaked and you bought a new tank and you took all of your livestock from your mature tank and you put in the sand and you moved all your rock over and you moved your corals over. What you did there was a tank transfer. It's still not a mature tank. You might have some corals that have been through a lot and they might be able to handle it because they're you know, used to it. But the thing is, is that the tank itself still has to settle in. Will it save some time in the long run? Yes. Does using water from the old tank benefit the uh, new setup? Not necessarily. There's not a lot in the water that benefits your livestock that you can't get from brand new salt mix. The water is going to be carrying all the elements that the corals need, uh, but... Uh, the bacteria tends to live on surfaces, so it's on the rock, it's in the sand, it's on the glass, you know, it's in the plumbing. So it's not free-floating bacteria necessarily. And if all the bacteria was in the water, then UV sterilizers would kill all the bacteria in your tank, right? Uh, we use UV sterilizers on aquariums to kill off things like algae spores that are in the water, or maybe to kill off ick 
that is not sitting on the fish but is in free floating or swimming uh, phase. And at that point, you would want to kill whatever you could that's blowing around. But using used water doesn't always benefit a new tank. I have definitely used some of the water from the previous tank, but I added a bunch of new salt water. So when I'm setting up a new tank, or if I'm going to bring a tank to my home, I have a bunch of salt water ready to go because you'll never, you'll never have enough. You're always like, oh, I wish I had a little more salt water ready. So have a lot ready. That way, if you have to put the fish in a temporary situation, while you're getting the tank set up because it took so long to get the plumbing right, or uh, you have a spill, something goes wrong. Uh, when we were breaking down the 280, we had an accident and we dumped a whole bunch of salt water on my carpet. That sucked. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I'm not really a huge fan of using used water, but I'm not saying you can't. But let's just say your used water from your old tank had a lot of phosphate and a lot of nitrate in it. You're just moving that problem into the new tank. So maybe you only use some of the water and then add a lot of pure water to dilute that down and make your system cleaner than what it was before. Um, Adam says that his watermelon zoas close up a lot and stay closed for days at a time. The other ones are just fine. You're going to need to look at that colony specifically and really observe it. I would even suggest watching it from a distance if you don't see anything up close. There could be some kind of a pest that's in there. It could be that something is nipping at it like a hippo tang. Um, it could be that there is something strangling those zoas. I remember I had a patch of zoas, all the rest of my tank were happy, and they were just looking odd and closed up, and there was even some that had like a little thread around them. <laughs> it made them look like a circumcised penis. And I just was like, that's no good. And I took a toothbrush and I brushed away that fiber, that little bit, and it made the zoas open up again. Another trick, I know it sounds insane, but I did it. I took a turkey baster and I put it right on the tip of the close-up zoanthid and kind of created a little vacuum to kind of remove anything that was on the surface so we could open up. Because uh, I felt like whatever was on it, whatever mucus was, was like keeping it sealed. And I, if I can get that mucus off, the coral could breathe. And that seemed to work. It's not a guaranteed solution, but it was some of my workarounds. So more flow, blowing it off, small, very soft toothbrush, uh, picking stuff off, watching for anything that's attacking the corals. These are the things you want to watch for. Nanofish says, is your ATM plumbed straight to your tank? Absolutely not. My, uh, my RO, and I think what you mean is your RODI system, because an ATO is going to be tied to your tank. The RODI system is a constant source of water, just like the faucet on your sink is the constant flow of water that just, you know, you open the faucet and it's going to go down the drain until you close that faucet. Would you leave that faucet on all the time? No way. And with an RODI system that can make 100 gallons a day, that means in 24 hours it can produce 100 gallons of water. Let's say you have a tank that is a 55-gallon aquarium and you have a 100-gallon-a-day system tied to it. That's a huge risk. Huge risk that you're going to not only flood your home, you're going to cause all kinds of damage. You're going to kill the salinity in your tank. So I have an RODI system with tubing that goes through my attic area and into the fish room to a reservoir that has a float valve in it. And once a week, I turn on the RO system and let it refill the reservoir. And when the reservoir is full, a float rises up, and it makes the RO system shut off. But it doesn't keep it off. It kind of like shudders to life like once every 15 seconds to bug me. Unless I do it, you know, unless I turn it off sooner. And I'm like, okay, and I go shut off the valve and stop it entirely until it's time to make water a week from now. And my reservoir then will be tied to the sump with an auto top-off gizmo. I'm using the ATK on my one tank, and I'm using the Smart ATO Micro on my frag system. And both of those have reservoirs that they draw water to top off the tank as uh, evaporation occurs. Um... Nick says, you mentioned before your dad kept a sea apple in his tank. Did you ever find out what happened to it? Did you have any toxicity problems from it? My dad had all kinds of stuff in his saltwater aquarium that were uh, available at that time in those days. And you know, sea apple is beautiful. And the pre uh, prevailing thought is it's a hand grenade in your reef, that something bad could happen. And that's one of the reasons I've never bought one. I kind of want to. <laughs> <laughs> which sounds stupid it's a hand grenade but at the same time i've seen it in a few tanks and man it looked nice but at the same time i have averted or avoided any kind of disasters in my tanks all these years so maybe i'd be smarter just staying away from that creature 
The sea apple is a beautiful animal, a great filter feeder. I don't know what makes them die. You know, like what is causing them to implode and explode and kill your reef. But uh, I don't know if it's a lack of food, if they're being attacked by a butterfly fish, for example, you know, or some or trigger bit into it. I have no idea. But I haven't seen anyone with a long-term reef that had a sea apple in their tank. So, you know, if I came across a guy who had a tank for 15 years and he's had the sea apple for 15 years, I'd be way more inclined to want to get one because of his great success story. But I'd also want to know how he's kept it well-fed and happy and, and did he run into any kind of surprises. They don't tend to move around a lot. They find a spot, they secure themselves to the rock work, and then they just extend these beautiful, colorful uh, appendages that grab food from the water. And then they, there's like five or six of them around the oral disc and they just bring one in and just kind of lick it clean and then they put it back out ready to catch the next bit and the next one comes in and the next one and the next one and they just do this non-stop. It's really neat. Beautiful, beautiful creatures. Awesome for macro photography. But, uh, no, and um, I don't even remember how, I'll have to ask my dad what happened to his tanks. I think that once he bought a house, you know, we were in an apartment at the time, I guess he just decided not to have a tank anymore. I don't know if he just brought everything back to the fish store. I'll have to ask him on my next phone call. Good question. Um, Adrian asks, I had SPS coral and it died. So, when our tank matured. All right, so basically the question is, how mature does your tank have to be for SPS corals? Uh, I have a full article about what SPS corals need, and it's a really good topic to read up on more than me to just talk about for two minutes on a live stream. But SPS stands for small polyp stony, but there was a saying that went around years ago called stability promotes success, SPS. So the more stable your system, the more mature the tank is, the more mature you are as a reef keeper, the better your husbandry is, the more likely you'll do well with SPS corals. There are guys that will always be out there that said, yeah, I set up my tank and a week later I put in my SPS corals and wow, check it out, it looks amazing. And yeah, some guys are able to do that. Are they able to do it long term? Time will tell. You know, you saw Jimmy's SPS reef, it was gorgeous and it had been around for many years and doesn't even run a skimmer. And he's dosing a whole bunch of alkalinity and calcium and magnesium daily and uh, his corals are just growing like crazy and they're gorgeous. But um, ideally, it's better to start off if you're newer in the hobby with easier corals and don't really take on the SPS until you're super comfortable with your tank. And I think that once you can maintain stability, day in, day out, things are rock solid, you're not having weird swings in parameters, you're not having weird swings in temperature, your lighting is adequate for an SPS coral, then I think you'll have better success. I had a guy recently reach out to me on Facebook and he said, you know, Mark, how do I color up my red planet? And I said, what does it look like now? And he showed me a picture and I said, yeah, it looks great. <laughs> Didn't have to do anything. And I also asked, how are all the rest of your corals doing? And he was like, well, and so he sent me a bunch of pictures and everything in his tank looked good. Everything looked like it was healing or, or growing and uh, encrusting. And I saw nothing to, to focus on or to complain about. And I told him, I said, you know, everything looks good. Just keep doing what you're doing. So sometimes it's just a matter of uh, maybe sitting back and enjoying what you have instead of nitpicking some of these smaller details to death. Because that's kind of where my live stream a couple weeks ago about having more patience. Patience is so important in this hobby. And you definitely want to appreciate what you can uh, while it's going well. Because when things are really falling apart, you're, you're not going to have any patience at all, and you're going to be very frustrated, and you're going to be spending a lot of money trying to fix things. Uh, Dustin says, have you ever had a cowfish? No, I have not. There's certain fish that are neat looking, goofy looking, and I have no desire to get them whatsoever. <laughs> so, all right, what else? Hey, we're over an hour. We should stop the live stream. All right, so... Next weekend, I am going to be in Seattle. That is going to be for ReefWorks. And I will be sure to add the link to the event in this video's description uh, in a little bit here. And then 
Two days later, I'm off to Florida to do a presentation there for a club meeting in FMAS. And then uh, the end of March, first day of April, is going to be Aquashella here in Dallas. And so I'll be there. So these are some events that you can, if you're in any of those areas where you can go, you should go. You should always go. Go to any kind of event that's going on in your area to interact with other hobbyists and learn things. And it's not all about spending money. It's about seeing new things and, and absorbing knowledge. That's what I, I'm always looking for. When I see people filming at the events and then they share it on YouTube, I'm always hoping they'll share one new thing they learned rather than just showing us a video montage of corals because corals are great, but we need the knowledge to keep the corals alive. Today is water test Saturday. I tested my water two days ago, but I'm going to test again um, because I made some little tweaks in my system. I can tell you this, that my phosphates were up and now they're not. And that's why you're going to get a lanthanum chloride video later today. And uh, nitrates are still off the charts. Um, I did not mail off my ICP stuff because I didn't know how much postage I needed on the boxes. So I drug my feet on it and all of a sudden it was Friday. I was like, oh, I still didn't mail it. So they're going to be mailed next week. And I am going to be measuring the reef, the frag system, and then the new batch of salt water I just mixed up because I'm curious to see what all three of those give me as reports. And then after I've taken the samples out of the tanks, I think I'm just going to go ahead and do a water change. <gasps> so that would be the first water change my reef has had, um, I believe, in 18 months. It's a long time. And uh, then I think I will wait before I come back from my trip to Florida to start, uh, maybe I'll do it sooner. Maybe I'll start dosing no pox, but kind of don't want to be out of town when that stuff's going into my tank. You know, I, again, like I, you know, I said, you know, if you're gonna try something new, be there to observe it, use it at half the strength they recommend, you know, and kind of build up. And uh, I do have a new dosing pump I need to try out. But again, see, even that, do I want to hook up something brand new before I leave town? No, I want to be here. So I think maybe all that stuff will happen next week after I get back from Florida. Um, in the next 10 days, and then I'll do it. So there will not be a live stream next Saturday because I will be busy at ReefWorks. And, uh, but there'll still be videos rolling out uh, as I get them edited and uploaded to YouTube. You have that to look forward to. And if you have any questions, you can always find us in Club Milos Reef. Let me throw that on here for you guys. We are coming up on 4,000 members. Uh, every day we pick up you know, 20, 30 more people. And uh, it's a good group. It's a group full of positive, helpful people. And we had a guy that was not positive nor helpful, and I sent him a message, and he told me to kiss it. So he's out of the group. So we are still good. <laughs> I got to love it. I got to love it. We have a great group full of people that are willing to help each other. So that is where we are with that, and you're welcome to join it. If you're not on Facebook, I don't know what to tell you. This is the group. So I guess the other choice is for you to just talk to me here on YouTube and uh, get answers that way. Or you can always reach me on my website at milasreef.com. Mila's Reef is a website full of information. A lot of things I talk about are articles on the website. You can read them later in, in more concise fashion instead of sitting through an hour of me rambling on a topic. And uh, there's lots of pictures. There's a lot of documentation, my blogs. And then, of course, there are all the things that I sell. So feel free to shop for things you need for your aquarium because when you buy things from me, it lets me feed Spock. And Spock loves to eat, so keep buying things. I really appreciate that. Other than that, I hope you guys have a great weekend. And I'm going to wrap up this stream now. And I want to thank my moderators for helping me today and keeping the peace and making sure that all the questions flowed. I thought today's live stream went better than it has in the past. We don't have those big, long lags waiting for me to answer a question. And I'm going to answer one last question because I see it here on my screen. And then I'm going to hit end. Virginia says that she has a 49-gallon breeder with LPS. Should she have a skimmer or a sump, I would actually suggest both. Get yourself a sump under that breeder and put yourself a skimmer in there and uh, enjoy your tank. All right, guys, have a great weekend. Bye.